The Fugitives, an NPT original production, is made possible in part by a grant from the Metropolitan Nashville Arts Commission. In the early 20th century, a coterie of poets gathered in Nashville, Tennessee, determined to redefine the way the world viewed the South. They would prove that the South could produce highly intellectual art. But even as these modernist poets fled the constraints of the Old South, the South would forever have her hold on them. Reuniting to defend the region, they found their paths diverging, their relationships strained, and their reputations in question. Whether fleeing or defending, they remained literary fugitives. Post-World War I America. Model T's rolling off assembly lines, flappers are all the rage, and the new sounds of jazz excite and energize audiences. But despite an abundance of activity and apparent growth, the war to end all wars damaged life well beyond the battlefield. The extent to which the First World War had a tremendous impact on the American intellectual mind is frequently forgotten. The sense of alienation, the sense of reservation about human reason and the reliability of history, uh, all of the things that we see coming out of World War I and the lost generation and the expatriates in Paris, those things were part of the Southern experience too. Nashville, Tennessee was growing along with the rest of America a city fractured by the Civil War and now the loss of another generation of young men. It adapted by the growth of industry and a focus on education. Vanderbilt University, newly separated from the Methodist Episcopal Church, endeavored to offer a first-rate education to its students. The fugitive poets basically were two sets. There were people who were faculty and students at Vanderbilt in the early 1920s, and there were some townies and they would get together and argue about poetry. Here's a group of very bright young men with very good education. This was a university group for the, for the most part. And they were coming out of the old traditional southern small town and the popular poetry of the time was the poetry of idealism. The uh, original um, arrangement was a combination of uh, intellectual curiosity, artistic talent, and an exchange of ideas among people who brought different intellectual interests to bear. And they just felt a kind of need to recreate, to make new from the beginning. Since the civilization up to 1917 had clearly failed. What made the fugitive different and made it lasting is that no less than four of them became professional men of letters. The professional poets were John Cor Ransom and Donald Davidson, Alan Tate, and Robert Penn Warren. All four of them were Vanderbilt graduates at different times. It had to do mostly with a regional challenge, that nobody in the South could be smart that the South was, as H.L. Mencken said in 1917, the Sahara of the Beaux-Arts. You know, down there, he added up the IQ of everybody in the South that still wouldn't come to a double-digit number. And he challenged the South regionally. Everybody in the South who aspired to any kind of cultural life at all had read that essay. And they probably had a picture of H.L. Mencken up on their walls and threw darts at it or something like that, or, you know, a voodoo doll and they stuck pins in it. The emphasis on poetry, I think, would stem from the fact that Ransom wrote poetry. They had a, a very strong sense of the value or the importance of poetry in a culture, and if a culture didn't have poetry, then that culture really had not matured. Ransom, in the 1920s, wrote most of his best poetry. It was consciously archaic in diction, and he played that up against a very witty, sarcastic, ironic way of doing things. Bells for John Whiteside's daughter. <laughs> 
There was such speed in her little body and such lightness in her footfall. It is no wonder her brown study astonishes us all. Her wars were brooded in our high window. We looked among orchard trees and beyond, where she took arms against her shadow, or harried unto the pond the lazy geese, like a snow cloud, dripping their snow on the green grass, tricking and stopping, sleepy and proud, who cried in goose, alas, for the tireless heart within the little lady with rod that made them rise from their noon apple dreams and scuttle goose fashion under the skies. But now go the bells, and we are ready. In one house we are sternly stopped to say we are vexed at her brown study, lying so primly propped. In Ransom you can see that this is a literary imagination. It's about language for Ransom. Reading his poems becomes almost like doing the New York Times crossword puzzle on Friday when it gets really hard. Tate's a lot different. You can see him and thinking this is a very smart guy who processes the world through his brain. And everything that happens to him is going to be analyzed intellectually. And you can tell that looking at the poems. It's all about intellectual analysis of, of stimuli that come in. Whereas for Warren, it goes through his gut. For Tate, it goes through his head. Let us lie down once more by the breathing side of ocean, where our live forefathers sleep as if the known sea still were a month wide. Atlantis howls, but is no longer steep. What country shall we conquer? What fair land unman our conquest and locate our blood? We've cracked the hemispheres with careless hands. Now from the gates of Hercules we flood westward, westward till the barbarous brine whelms us to the tired land where tasseling corn, fat beans, grapes sweeter than muscadine, rot on the vine. In that land were we born. Tate was extremely well read. He was the apostle of modernism for this group. I have a theory that Alan Tate did what Picasso was doing with painting, bending and, and pressing the language into structures, into syntactical arrangements and rhetorical patterns, twist it around and play with it in very strange ways, trying to torsion something new out of it. Alan Tate always said that Davidson had the greatest natural talent for writing poetry of the whole group. Of, I'm not sure that's true, but Alan Tate certainly thought so. You look at Donald Davidson and you think, well, I'm just sitting on the front porch listening to a story. He wanted to tell stories in his poetry. He was old then, I was a child. His hand held out for mine, some daybreak snatched away, and he rode out a broken man. Now let his lone grave keep surer than cypress roots the vow I made beside him. God too late unseals to certain eyes the drift of time and the hopes of men and a sacred cause. The fortune of the leaves goes with the land whose sons will keep it still. My mother told me much. She sat among the candles, fingering the memoirs now so long unread. And as my pen moves on across the page, her voice comes back, a murmuring distillation of old Virginia times, now faint and gone, the hurt of all that was and cannot be. Davidson's poems were rather beautiful lyrics and commentaries. When he matured, he, his poetry more and more became consciously Southern. So one of the things you wanted to try to do if you were a modern Southerner, which these guys were, was prove that you could produce intellectual art. Not folk art, but intellectual art. So one of the pressures that they were under and took on to themselves was to prove that a Southern place and Southern people in that place could 
produce art on the world stage? The fugitives were uh, filled with purpose early on. They had a sense of who they were and where they should go and where the uh, world of culture should go in the 20th century. They knew it had to take new directions and forge new paths into the future, and they were very committed to that enterprise. Nashville was well established as a printing center, producing volumes of religious publications. By the time the well-traveled bon vivant Sidney Hirsch persuaded the group to publish their own literary magazine. It's sort of like those movies you see where Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland are saying, I know where there's a barn, why don't we put on a show? We're all talented. And so they decided they'd have a magazine. This was not a rare idea since there were dozens of small local literary magazines in Europe and the United States at the time. The Little Magazine and the Quarterly were places where the ideas of the day were hashed out. These magazines were where these Poems were tested, but also where the ideas of the day were tested by art. Criticism tested the art. The art tested the ideas. They were original in one sense in that their magazine was going to be exclusively poetry. They admitted book reviews and critical essays, but they never went to prose narrative. These guys decided they were going to be pure poets and critics of poetry. While The Fugitive offered the more established members a venue for their work, poetry contests with cash prizes enticed new voices to their circle. The first time you see Robert Penn Warren's name, he's entered one of the contests. He was 18 years old. He didn't win. He should have. I mean, the, the poet that won is like, who and what? But he didn't win. Can you sit alone, which is the beginning of error. Behind you, the music and lights of the great hotel. Solution, perhaps, is public, despair, personal. But history held to your breath, clouds like a mirror. There are many states and towns in them and faces. But meanwhile, the little old lady in black by the wall, who admires all the dancers and tells you how just last fall her husband died in Ohio and damp missed her glasses. She blinks and croaks like a toad or a norn in the horrible light and rattles her crutch, which may put forth a small bloom, perhaps white. We know Warren mostly as a novelist. That one book, All the King's Men, probably the great political novel of all time. But Warren was a poet all his life. The stylistic choices made by the four poets are clearly different, their voices are different. As you move among these writers, you see that while they shared many things in common, they, they were unique, they were different, and each one had not only a different style, but a different perspective that was consonant with that style. Well, the chemistry is not always gonna happen. You're not always gonna have a teacher like John Crow Ransom, whose pen name was Roger Prim. And he picked that self-consciously because in terms of poetic taste, he was a prim critic. He wanted metrical, regularity, stanzaic form, a recognized poetic structure. But you would get a very smart aleck and aggressive student like Alan Tate who wanted to push him in a different direction. And then you get this 18-year-old student, Robert Penn Warren, who was like a, a mini volcano wanting to erupt in poetry all the time. And a junior faculty member like Donald Davidson who wanted poetry to be communicative to echo ballad styles and tell stories. And you put all those things in the pot, you don't know what's gonna happen. What did happen was that they all fed off of one another, but you don't know that's gonna happen. You could throw all those guys into a closet and they'd all come out in tatters. Each of them has a strongly individual voice, but, it, but those voices were formed in dialogue with one another. It's a kind of alchemical magic that happens in a writer's group. Vanderbilt was a focus for each of these people, but the real education was going on in that living room on Whitland Avenue.
kind of mythology that has collected around it because they were dedicated to poetry. Poetry was the genre in which the modern consciousness, the modern literary consciousness was going to prove itself. Um, it had a lot to prove, especially after the First World War. It was where all the big name modern literary artists were practicing. This is where reputations were going to be made in poetry. This is where the changes were going to be made. This is where those changes will be recorded on human consciousness. I think the chief inspiration for the modernity of the fugitives was rebellion against the Old South. Official exception having been taken by the sovereign people to the mint julep, a literary phase known rather euphemistically as Southern literature has expired, like any other stream whose source is stopped up. The demise was not untimely. Among other advantages, the fugitive is enabled to come to birth in Nashville, Tennessee, under a star not entirely unsympathetic. The fugitive flees from nothing faster than from the high caste Brahmins of the Old South. John Crow Ransom, The Fugitive, Volume 1. They were trying not to be Southern. We have to remember what Southern meant around 1920. To be Southern in the popular sort of view it probably meant civil war, slavery, the lost cause, probably meant bells in, in large gowns, genteel poverty, and moonlight and magnolias, which in their view become pretty cliched. So they didn't want to be Southern that way. With the creation of The Fugitive, the Nashville poets made their mark on the modern literary world. Their little magazine would come to represent an intellectual, disciplined, classical school of poetry from the fugitives, poets of the American South. Poetry is the highest calling of the human mind. The fugitives believe that passionately. In fact, passion and intellect fused in poetry could be one of the best ways to describe what they aimed for and what they achieved. In December 1925, the Fugitive magazine publishes its final issue. The same year, the Scopes trial takes place in Dayton, Tennessee, drawing national media attention. The trial pits religion against science and tradition against modernism. Writers like H. L. Mencken revel in portraying Southerners as uneducated, backwards, and bigots. This sparks a fire in the Nashville intellectuals who feel compelled to respond to the Northerners' false portrayal. It fuels the writer's growing disillusionment with industrialism, consumerism, and urban growth. Tate, Davidson, and eventually Ransom take up the mantle of agrarianism and recruit Warren and several new writers to join in their literary retort. Agrarianism grows out of the conflict between 20th century America and the world and urban life and that background that they came out of. The small town, rural, very threadbare. They got interested in the idea that the nation needed to move back toward that simple life. In part, what they were doing was trying to speak back to the industrialized North and say that an agrarian society gave the individual more dignity than being a wage slave. That was a part of what uh, the agenda was. It was a, a, a moral argument more than a historically accurate argument. The agrarians were concerned with the good life, with a life which is not materialistic and not part of the urban situation spreading all over the world. This reckless, boom and bust, materialistic economy. The outcome of all this was that you had these two clashing emotions, the heroic past as they saw it, and the inglorious present. And out of the tension came this agrarianism. You gotta remember that the same year that the fugitives stopped is the year of the Scopes trial in Dayton. And that was a real shock to Ransom and Davidson, who were still here still in town, in Tennessee. And although that cultural shock took place too late to get into the pages of The Fugitive, it did later come out, indirectly came out in the essays in I'll Take My Stand. That group developed agrarianism as a, a movement in 
it is in doing that that Davidson, I think, found what he wanted to do. Now, whether that was a good thing or not is questionable. As their writing changed from poetic to socio-political, they presented their ideals for the Southern region in a collection of essays titled, I'll Take My Stand. Of late, however, there is the melancholy fact the South itself has wavered a little and shown signs of wanting to join up behind the common or American industrial ideal. It is against that tendency that this book is written. The younger Southerners, who are being converted frequently to the industrial gospel, must come back to the support of the Southern tradition. They must be persuaded to look very critically at the advantages of becoming a new South which will be only an undistinguished replica of the usual industrial community. John Crow Ransom, A Statement of Principles. When they molted or changed over to be agrarians in the late 20s, they had to make a decision. Since they were making public policy statements about the South, they had to in one degree or another, confront Jim Crow, the apartheid system of racial segregation in the South. Some of these same men became members of the agrarian group, and during that period, the very different period and a very different group uh, wrote essays that were frankly racist uh, by contemporary standards, by today's standards. For the Negroes were cannibals and barbarians, and therefore dangerous. No white man who had any contact with slavery was willing to free the slaves and allow them to dwell among the whites. Frank Lawrence Ousley, The Irrepressible Conflict. Warren was the one who confronted race in his essay, The Briar Patch. He confronted it by recommending Booker T. Washington's position of separate but equal. Warren argued that it was basically pragmatic for African Americans to create a separate community. And he said that that was the only practical way for racial harmony to exist. Maybe, he says, in time this will change, but not now. There are strong theoretical arguments in favor of higher education for the Negro, but those arguments are badly damaged if, at the same time, a separate Negro community or group is not built up which is capable of absorbing and profiting from those members who have received this higher education. If this does not occur, if the Negroes in the South cannot support their more talented and better equipped individuals, the unhappy process of the past will continue and the educated Negro will leave the South to seek his fortune elsewhere. Robert Penn Warren, The Briar Patch. Much to their chagrin, Warren's fellow writers felt he was advocating for the rights of African Americans at a time when Nashville was still in the grips of endemic racism. He's the one of the group who moves in a direction to try to find out how the races do in fact live together and what can be done about institutionalizing some kind of harmony. Warren feels guilt, feels anxiety, and wants to find a way to resolve it. I don't believe the other ones actually saw the problem the same way. Donald Davidson became a member of the White Citizens Councils in the 1950s and 60s and remained, I think, a pretty flagrant white supremacist till his death. Um, Ransom floated, as he does, floated above the issue. Some of the contributors to I'll Take My Stand were wrong in their racial attitudes at the time, and they eventually recanted. Warren, I think, very quickly. Certainly, uh, Tate did. I don't associate that, really, with Ransom. Robert Penn Warren wrote two books later in his life taking back what he had said in that unfortunate contribution to I'll Take My Stand, the Agrarian Manifesto. In his 1965 publication, Who Speaks for the Negro, Warren interviewed many participants of the Civil Rights Movement, 
including Martin Luther King Jr., Ralph Ellison, Malcolm X, and others, to gain insight and understanding of the struggles they faced head-on in the mid-1960s. The most important thing to say about um, a Warren or a Tate is that they corrected the record. They said they were wrong. Released in the midst of the Great Depression, the 1930 publication of I'll Take My Stand never realized much financial success, but made a lasting impact on literary and academic circles. While these writers will forever be remembered for their contributions to this Southern manifesto, each achieved literary success beyond the confines of the agrarian doctrine. Two literary movements, countless poems, books, and untold academic influence. The group is also credited with contributions to the formal critical analysis of poetry, known as New Criticism. They learned many of their critical principles, uh, critical principles that have come to be called the New Criticism, from their own poetic practice. The Fugitive Poet's emphasis on poetry as crafted, perfected, individual, autonomous works of art was the genesis of the most influential aspect of the new criticism. They created the contours of a movement. It was an intellectual project and a cultural project that they thought uh, would push civilization forward. Art is a snapshot of an insight into a culture at a particular moment in history. They reveal certain social dynamics as they were unfolding in modern thought. They were part of an international voice that was modernism. Their unique preparation for coming to the modernist conversation came out of the South, but they also had uh, talent and education and knowledge of the larger world that carried them out to that world. You got an encounter of the past and the present in their work. They're all a remarkable group of men. They all came together at that time, in that place, and yet they remained influenced by what they were at that time for the rest of their lives. They have spawned, taught, influenced many, many generations of other poets since then. Their influence is still felt. It's that mystique of we band of brothers, we happy few. You know, we're going to create Southern poetry right here, right now. And they did. The Fugitives, an NPT original production, was made possible in part by a grant from the Metropolitan Nashville Arts Commission.